Hey everybody, uh, I hope you enjoyed worship. Today we're going to be in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, and if you don't know exactly where that is, that's okay. It's at the front kind of quarter of the Bible right here, and it's right after 1 Kings. So if you guys want to take some time to turn there, um, you can do that. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pray for the message today. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and spend time in your word. I pray that all distractions around us would um, just cease and that your voice would be the loudest in our life, um, that you would speak through me, that you would open our eyes to your word and the truths that you have for us today. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we're so thankful that we can come together and worship you today. So today we're going to be talking about this um, time between when something happens in our lives, maybe it's a bad circumstance or we're told something about our future and the time between whenever that happens and when God shows up, when the promise of God comes to fruition or when the bad circumstances of, of our lives turn into something different, we walk out of a different season into a new one that we maybe enjoy more. What happens in between that time, and we're going to call that time in the meantime. Today's sermon is about what happens in the meantime, in the meantime between that time where something bad happens or we're given a promise or whatever we want to see happen and the time when it actually happens in our life. Our life is full of these times of in the meantime. And if you look at the Bible, the Bible is chock full of these times in the meantime. And a lot of times, for some reason, we don't get to see the 40 years that happened between Moses uh, and, and the burning bush and, and rescuing the Israelites. We don't get to see all the time in between Joseph and we get to see a little bit more of his time. But we don't get to see all of the in the meantime. So many times we're skipping a verse or two and it's 40 or 50 years, maybe even longer um, even the Israelites, right? They spent 400 years in the meantime uh, and they in, got enslaved by the Egyptians before God came and saved them. King David and Job, the Bible is chocked full of these stories. And we're going to look at a woman who... Um, we find in 2 Kings chapter 4, we're not actually ever told her name. We just know that this woman is a Shunammite, that she had been helping a prophet named Elisha, and that she had helped him so much that, in fact, that she had built him kind of a little room in addition to her house that he must have come by so many times that she knew that he needed his own bed to, to stay and help out and just a place to rest. And we're going to start reading... 2 Kings um, chapter 4 and verse 8. And it says, One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put it, um, put it, Put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when Elisha came up, he went up to his room and lay down there. He came to his servant Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, Tell her, You have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of an army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway about this time next year. Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who has many reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. His father told his servant, carry him to his mother. 
After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat up on her lap about until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of my servants and a donkey so I could go to the man of God quickly in return. Why go to him today? He asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she sat out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, look, the man of God said to the servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took off her feet. Gehazi come over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes. This woman is in the meantime. She got of the fulfillment of a prophecy from Elisha that she was going to have a son and she had seen it come true and the boy was raised up in her home, something that would have been seemingly impossible, but yet something bad has occurred. And in the midst of the meantime, she runs back to the, the source of her blessing to Elisha. And we see that even though she told everybody else that she was all right, that she runs back to Elisha and then she kind of comes before him and says, why did you do this to me? Why did you give me what I wanted, but then have taken it away? Have you ever been like this woman in the meantime? This story reminds me of the story of my dad. I can remember it vividly when my sister called me and I answered the phone and she was in tears and was trying to tell me what was going on with my father, but she couldn't get the words out. And I tried to calm her down. And what I finally got out of her was that my father, they believed had a heart attack and he was on his way to the hospital and they didn't even know that he was going to make it to the hospital. They didn't know what was going on, um, but they believed he had a heart attack. And she was calling to tell me that she didn't know if we would ever talk to our father again. And I um, had just recently recommitted my life to Christ and I can remember coming up to the church and we used to have these huge piles of dirt at the south end of our church and I can remember just wanting to sit on top of those and maybe uh, feel closer to God. I didn't really know why, but I went up to these dirt piles and I sat down and I began to cry and I don't know if it was because of my dad or the fact that I had just sat down in a bunch of stickers and I can just remember feeling so helpless. I didn't even take them out. I just sat in the pain of not only that, but my father and his passing. And I didn't know exactly what was going on. Was he going to live or was he going to die? And I was so afraid that he was going to pass before I could even talk to him again. I had entered a season of waiting on God's answer. Would he help us out in this situation? I can remember during my time of prayer, having this crazy thought come into my head that I was supposed to call my dad and share the gospel with him. Tell him that Jesus loved him and I was supposed to tell him one more thing that I believed that there was gonna be a bunch of tests ran on him, but nothing was gonna come back with anything on it. So I grabbed my phone after about 30 minutes of conversation with the Lord and telling God that I didn't wanna call my dad. This wasn't the time to share the gospel. Like this wasn't the time to do all this thing. And is this even you? Was this even from you? Or did I just have this crazy thought or, or I just made this up because I was in distress and I just continually felt like I was supposed to do it. And so I called my sister who handed my father the phone and I told him exactly what I just told you. I told him about the love of Christ. And I told him that I didn't think that any test was going to come back with anything on it. And I can remember that my dad hung up on me. He didn't want to hear about God's love. And he sure didn't want to hear about my crazy idea um, that there was going to be a bunch of tests ran on him. I had entered the meantime and week after week and month after month, I was on my knees in prayer, much like this woman in distress, asking God, for an answer, 
asking God to come to answer the prayer of helping my dad, not only to be healed of whatever was going on, but to be healed from his salvation need. He needed to be saved, his desperate need to be saved by Jesus. We had entered the meantime. But here's what happens when we are in a season of the meantime. I believe that there are three different things that happen when we are looking in the meantime. The first one is that we believe we actually forget that God is sovereign. When we lose control of our own life, we start to manipulate our thoughts about God. And we actually believe that he has lost control too. When we start to lose control, we believe that God has also lost control. But what I want you to know is that God is still in control. God still knows all things that God could easily prevent in his power, what he allows in his wisdom. Whatever we're going through, God could prevent in his power, but he is using it as a way to shape you back into the image of Christ. Christ has suffered all things and it made him um, go to the cross for us. And because of all of that, he scorned death so that we could live. And we need to understand that these seasons of being in the meantime, while they might not be as drastic as the two stories that I shared, that God is still in control and he knows what he's doing and he's using all things for the good of those that love him. The second thing that we forget is that God is faithful to us that we believe in the meantime, in the midst of these difficult situations or in the midst of waiting on a promise of God to come to fruition, that we believe that our current circumstances nullify God's faithfulness to us. Or maybe our circumstances have kind of pushed us to be unfaithful to God and we believe that our unfaithfulness our stepping away from an intimate relationship with God can really contradict God's faithfulness and that's not the truth. And what I want you to know is if you have something that's pushed you far away from God, that he's still waiting there and he wants to pick up right where you left off, that he still loves and he still cares about you and he's eternally faithful to you. And the last thing I believe that we forget is that God never leaves us and he never forsakes us. In the midst of all of the difficult circumstances that we face, one of the biggest things that I believe the enemy tries to get us to believe is that God doesn't care, that he's not near to us, that we're separated from him forever. And God's promise is that he has never left us and he'll never forsake us. And so no matter how loud the circumstances of your life are screaming, God is there and he is with you. And he might not rescue you from that circumstance, but he wants you to know that he will be with you every step of the way. In the midst of of being in the meantime, we see that this woman went back to the source of her blessing. And for me, in the midst of my father's meantime, I had to run to God. Difficult circumstances often push us one of two ways. We either run to the source of our blessing to God or we run away from him. And what I want you to know is that the answer of being in the meantime should push us back into an intimate relationship with God because he is the only one who has an answer. We see that as this Shunammite woman went back to Elisha, that he came back with her and he actually laid out on top of the boy and he breathed his life into the, he breathed breath into the boy and the boy came back to life. And if you would ask my dad to come down to Hayes, he would stand and front of you. And he would say that that night in the room was the beginning of an intimate relationship with Christ. Because the truth of the matter is, is month after month and test after test, almost every test humanly known to man was run on my dad and nothing came back with anything on it. See what happened is the year before, that summer before, 
He had actually had a double rotor, rotator cuff surgery. And when they did physical therapy, they didn't quite do it 100% correct. And he did develop this thing where the muscles in between his shoulder blades were so weakened because of the physical therapy that when he would overstress them, that they would tighten up so hard, it actually hit a nerve in his back and he would black out. He is one of five people in the world that this has ever happened to and God used it to bring him to himself. God can use all circumstances for the good of those who love him. I believe he's doing the same in your life. And so if you are experiencing difficult circumstances or waiting on an answer to prayer that God is using all things to point them back, point us back to himself, but he is using it to shape us more and more to be like Jesus. But what happens? What happens when life doesn't end up the way that we want it? What happens when my dad ends up passing away and I don't see an answer to prayer or Jesus doesn't resurrect a circumstance of our life and change it for our good? What happens when we don't see that really the end of the story the way we want it to? I can remember talking to a friend about her brother Her brother had developed cancer at a young age and they were praying and hoping and dreaming of um, chemo working and it just continued to um, deteriorate his health. And I can remember talking to her about all of these stories about people are saying, if you have enough faith, he can be healed. And all of these things were hurtful to her and all the prayers and all the things that had happened, he ended up passing away at a young age and no matter how hard things uh, they prayed, no matter how much faith they had, it didn't help the situation out. What happens, I can remember sitting down with her and having a conversation about this very thing. How do we handle these circumstances as Christians? How do we handle this young boy not being healed of cancer? How do we do all of this? And I can remember the day she told me her answer and she said to me, my brother was healed. I just didn't get to see it. And my mind was blown because what this girl had told me was that she has an eternal perspective. And the hope that we have as Christians is that we have the hope of eternity. We have a hope that goes beyond this life. And despite all the brokenness we experience, we have the hope of Jesus' return and creating a new heavens and a new earth. See, the truth of the matter is we are all in the meantime. Since Genesis 3, and the fall of humanity, when Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, every single human has been living in the meantime. And we have a hope that lasts beyond this time and this space and this current circumstance. And his name is Jesus. And on one day, he will return and all our hopes and all of our dreams and all of our prayers for a new life, for a new earth, they will come true because his promises will always remain true. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for giving us a hope that lasts beyond this life a hope that is set on eternity, a hope that defies death. God, thank you for sending your son to die the death we deserve and give us a life and a relationship with you. And I pray for people who maybe they're listening to this and they don't have a relationship with Christ or maybe a current circumstance has pushed them far away from you. I hope that they would know that you are there and you are extending out the invitation to come into an intimate relationship with you. And for those of you who 
are waiting in the meantime. Let's not forget that God is still in control. Let's forget that his promises, let's not forget that his promises will always come true and that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. Let's not forget the goodness of the character of God and let's remain strong in our faith in the meantime.